What I'm going to try to walk through and show you is a little bit more of a consensus view of where forecasters and economists um, who look, truly do this for a living um, think the world is going. And then I'll try to shed some insights, at least such that I have some as we go along. Um, so I've got some data from um, the Federal Reserve of Philadelphia. They conduct what many of you have probably seen quoted in various news articles or various sources. Um, they have a survey of, of forecasters. And they've been doing this for a long time, um, since 1968. Uh, there's a group of about 40 of these that are, that are doing the forecast. Um, and they use a variety of techniques in their own methodologies. Um, so let me just start off, and I'm going to hit kind of the main macro variables that you would read about in the paper and, and hear about. So, you know, GDP, inflation, employment. Um, so, you know, the thing that people talk a lot about first and foremost is output. Uh, real gross domestic product, or the GDP. Um, as many of you, I'm sure, are aware, the definition here, this is after accounting for inflation. So, so this is just real output, ignoring the price increases we would, we would observe. And the number to have in your mind is sort of a benchmark for the United States is about 3%. That's a long-run average that is, you know, a healthy growth measure. Um, and we're have, have coming out of the, of the crisis, we're, we're not there yet. So if you look at um, where people are forecasting um, an annual rate of growth over the next several years, it's still a very slow ramp up to get back to what many would call normal. Um, so modest growth, positive growth, which is good. Um, so numbers like 2.2, 2.3 over the next couple of years, trending up toward what people would think of as more of a steady state, healthy number like closer to 3%, but not until more like 2016. Um, so positive sign, but modestly positive. If you look at um, another measure, which is the uncertainty um, around that number, what's the, what's the chance of a bad scenario? It's really not that bad in some sense. And so if you look at looking ahead as they look at the risk of a, of a negative quarter, which um, think about that as a, you know, a micro recession, if you will, a tiny recession, um, it's, there's a small number, it's more like 10 to 12 percent. So you know, the, the, the story here, which I think is going to be a consistent theme, is um, positive but sort of modestly positive. Unemployment's another number, of course, we all think about and watch. Um, and again, sort of the benchmark number here, if 3 percent is our benchmark in uh, growth uh, in, in GDP, then 6% is sort of a natural unemployment rate. We don't get to zero because people are often transitioning, looking for jobs. Um, six would be a, a good rate. And it's that's, again, this theme is it's not until more like 2015, 2016, uh, we get back to that more healthy state, but the trend is the, trend is the right direction. Um, so if you look at where we are now, we're in the, in the mid sevens and, and the forecast is that to be coming down. There are broader measures that are also worth thinking about. So um, the, the, um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has something they look at that it's not just unemployment but underemployed. So this would include people, for example, who are forcibly part-time um, or who are discouraged workers. They've given up looking for a job for a while, so they don't show up in the unemployment roles, but, but they're not employed at the moment. Those numbers, depending on how broad a measure you use, are more like 12 to 18, which is still historically a little high. Um, so again, trending down, but still not um, kind of there yet. Workforce participation is also low compared to where we were before the crisis. Um, demographically, the base is expanding, so the pie is bigger, but the slice that's participating is still small. Um, so the sheer numbers in the workforce are up compared to 2000 and 2008 even, but the, but the percentage rate is a little bit down. Another number people think about is sort of this connection between GDP and unemployment. And there's this, you know, people talk about Oaken's Law, but the idea, basic intuitive idea, is to think about it takes some GDP growth to drive down unemployment. And around 3% GDP growth, we get pretty you know, healthy decreases in employment. And again, we're not going to get there until more like 2015, 16, um, per the forecast. So why do we see low growth? So we've got um, consumer spending issues. Um, so still incomes are not growing that quickly. Um, un unemployment we mentioned. There's still households, many of the households are still working through their debt, uh, much like the rest of the economy through the crisis, going through a deleveraging cycle. Um, uncertainty has been an issue, which I'll come back to in a minute, um, which is the, you know, the idea of what's the, what's the forecast look like. They're not as encouraged to spend. Um, business investment, there have been you know, modest profit prospects, and, and hopefully you're going to hear some exceptions today um, in a more you know, robust outlook probably in the region, you know, Houston, Austin, certain industry sectors. Uh, but across the board, it hasn't been, um, again, a, a sort of what people would think of as a very booming um, economy. Um, the government's been an issue, so government spending has been in the press again um, this week, um, obviously, and so um, a lot of people, that's sort of a split camp view. Some who view the, the government debt to GDP ratio as an extremely important issue. Some who view it as their pieces of paper, and at this point, I don't see the harm. Um, one of the things that people are thinking a lot about still is the linkage. 
If you think about the government debt issue, roughly speaking, three ways to get out of a big government debt problem. You grow your way out, you tax your way out, or you print money, right? Um, and, and if you look at the growth forecast, the growth is not super strong, at least for the next for, you know, few years. Um, it's not clear we had the political will to tax our way out of it. So that leaves inflation, um, which many have you know, some fears over. Uh, the good news on inflation, as it will come back to, the, to, come back to um, is that the data doesn't support it, the market doesn't support it. So if you look at where bond prices are, um, the inflation is just not built yet into the bond market. Um, so the yield curve, which we talk about, is not um, steep, or, steep upward sloping. Um, so if, if you're an inflation fear person, um, the market at least is, is not there. So let's talk about inflation. So the definition that, that I'll show is on consumer price index. Um, so this is a bundle of goods. It's notoriously difficult to, to forecast and it's controversial, um, in part because how do you control for quality um, as you think about prices changing over time? But again, the benchmark number here, if we've got a 3% GDP growth, a 6% unemployment rate, the benchmark inflation number is something like 4%. Um, we're not there because the economy hasn't been growing that quickly. If you look at the forecast, um, a couple of different measures, either the, the CPI, the broad measure people talk about, um, or based on what's core, we're still at numbers more like 2%. Um, so again, pretty modest inflation rates. Um, and the long-term forecasts over the next several years are still numbers like 2%. Um, and so people are talking about, I hear a lot about it from a real estate perspective, um, investors talking about if rates finally rise, and they, I think they think the catalyst would be, in, would be some inflation pressure, but if rates finally rise and required returns rise, then what happens to prices? That's people's fear. Um, but again, the, the good news if you're a sort of glass half full person um, is that the, that the market and the forecasters aren't seeing inflation um, as being a significant fear in the, in the near term. So big picture, we've got a, probably what will continue to be slow growth, um, improving, uh, continuing to improve balance sheets, um, unemployment that's still not, I would call, completely healthy, but it's getting better, um, work for t work, workforce participation, which is lower than we'd like it to be, but it's improving, um, low interest rates, probably lowish inflation, again, with some people probably in the tail of that, of that belief. Um, the, the kind of part of this um, that we're interested to talk here from our panelists as well is this leads up to an economy that is probably more about redistributing wealth among people rather than pure creation of wealth. So if you think about things like the energy sector that's doing well or health care, um, there is probably some pure wealth creation there, but some, in some cases what is you know, making some people very uh, successful is making others of us you know, pay more at the gas pump or pay more for energy costs as inputs or pay more for our health care costs. So that is redistributive rather than sort of pie enhancing, pie enhancing growth. Um, so this is small print so that you probably can't read it. This is a, a teaching technique. Um, <laughs> you, you put stuff in really small print and then put it on the test. Um, so um, this was just from, if, if you followed the, the, the stuff a couple weeks ago about the quantitative easing, where the Fed decided to keep easing um, and, and didn't dial back. This is the, the forecast that came out with that meeting. And the main thing I'll, I'll, I wanted to point out to you is, is that uh, the, the, the part that came out of that meeting was they downwardly revised their beliefs um, from the Fed about growth, but it wasn't dramatic. But it was enough to spur them to think that they would continue to buy back bonds and continue to put money, money into the economy. And the kinds of numbers you see, their, their previous projection um, for example, for 2013 was a 2.3 to 2.6% growth, and now they dialed it back to 2 to 2.3. So 30 basis points uh, change kind of in the growth prospects, but not, you know, so some, a little bit more modest, which encouraged them then to continue the easing, but not so severe that they're thinking, you know, now we're down to 0% zero, zero growth or, or a very extreme view. Um, so another issue is, is, is sort of policy and, and perception over uncertainty. This is an interesting um, index that has been constructed where they track people's views towards uncertainty over policy itself. Um, and so you can see kind of a time series here through the 80s. You see some spikes during elections, during um, war, act, war type activities. Um, and then you see a run up you know, in the, during the crisis, um, Lehman, um, the election, the fiscal cliff issue the first time, that kind of thing. So you get these spikes. Um, the kind of good news, if you squint enough, is toward the end of 2012, it's coming down. Um, let me show you the most recent year. Um, so if you look at the most recent year, again, the index was up as high as, as, as 200 around the turn of the year, and it's been scaling back, um, scaling back since then. And I don't have the most recent couple of weeks. I'm kind of curious to see what's been happening with the, with the government issues. Um, I can tell you, you know, at least the good news has been, and I didn't look yesterday because I got swamped, but 
um, the stock market wasn't um, cratering, which is, which is a good sign, so maybe it's not that bad. But you do see a, pr a pretty uh, positive trend in terms of policy uncertainty. Um, and the last thing, just to kind of tie it together, I want to go back to, to kind of the Fed and, and link up two things that I hear a lot of people talking about, which are the macroeconomy and interest rates. Because um, as investors, a lot of us are, are worried. You know, we teach from the beginning of, of the MBA program, for example, you know, when rates go up, prices go down and, and vice versa. So we're worried a lot about rates. It's a, it's a key input um, to a lot of our decision making. So what I've got here is this is the, the Fed's forecast itself um, from the Open Market Committee. And you've got the real data is the line, and then you get the, 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 the forecast dispersion is where it parts. The dark color is the you know, confidence interval that's tighter, and the lighter color is the wider confidence interval. But the, the takeaway here from this, again, is the scale is around 2%. And so you get a you know, pretty consistent picture of modest but positive growth, a fairly tight, I think, confidence interval overall around that growth. So it looks you know, comparatively um, less uncertain, if you will, going forward. And a long run leveling off, um, again, sort of around 2016, at around a 3% rate, coming back down a little bit in the longer run. The bottom graph is showing the Fed's um, committee's view of when they think they will have to raise rates. Um, and what you can see is, that, so the little cluster of, of dots, 2013 and 14, tells you that basically nobody sampled thinks they'll have to raise rates until 2000, end of 2014 and 2015, where you see the dots start to line up vertically is 2015 and 16. So that's the Fed telling you, um, the people who are making the decision on the committee, that they don't forecast having to raise rates until closer to 2015 and 16. Um, so it's consistent with the idea that we're in for positive, modest growth um, and continued, uh, continued improvement in the employment picture. Um, but because it's modest, we don't need the kind of rate increases probably for a couple more years. So I'll stop there. As opposed to the 2014 specific, you know, macroeconomic situation, uh, and also just being related uh, here in Texas, we're based in Texas. But I wanted to. Most of our business is global, and we sell products uh, around the world. Samsung is our biggest customer. But I wanted to bring kind of one of the big trends that we see going on in the world, kind of back here, and how they, it can kind of impact the lives. So hopefully, out of the next 15 minutes, I can convey what uh, the Internet of Things is. You're probably sitting there wondering what that means. Let me give you a, a quick introduction to Silicon Labs. You guys are probably all pretty familiar with the, uh, the picture here. We're the largest homegrown semiconductor company in town. Uh, we were, uh, went public in 2000, and uh, we've had a good, good track record of diversifying into lots of different markets and products uh, and revenue growth. We're about $600 million in revenue. We've got a nice profitable uh, business model about 1,000 employees, about half of them here in Austin, uh, but we do R&D worldwide. We just acquired a company in Oslo, so we have design going on in a couple locations in Europe, three locations in the U.S., including Silicon Valley, which is really the heart of, uh, of our industry, and then also one in China and uh, one in Singapore, where our international headquarters is. Most of our supply chain is located uh, in Asia. We're a fabulous, fabulous company, so that means we don't own our own fab. We design, market, sell our products. Um, and the, the, the concept of mixed signal, our, we sell chips that go into electronic stuff. And mixed signal are the chips that go between the real world and the digital world of computing. So they interface, you know, either they're communicating or they're sensing or they're turning things off and on and processing all of that information. So those are the types of chips uh, that we work on, and we serve a broad range of markets. We don't sell into handsets and we don't sell into PCs, but into lots of industrial consumer communications type devices with like 10,000 customers, which in itself is a huge challenge. Uh, and, and certainly intellectual property is, is, a, is, a, is a big part of what we do. But we're really proud to be here in Austin and uh, glad to be part of the Texas uh, business community for sure. Okay, so these are the, these are the three trends that we see just in general driving uh, our, the semiconductor business and the technology uh, business and really are creating a number of inflection points uh, with which uh, creates opportunity. I guess you can talk about the wealth redistribution, but you know, changing market shares between companies and change, you, know, you see you know, the PC going 
down, maybe the handset's coming up, and I want to talk about kind of what is the next one, which I believe is the Internet of Things. But really, you've got green technology and the drive towards energy efficiency to help make our, our businesses more uh, efficient, to help you know, improve the quality of life of people around the world, and lots of stuff going on, low power devices, energy uh, efficiency in our power supplies and data centers and motors and, and all, all throughout the economy. Uh, you've got uh, the demand for data and the bandwidth explosion that's really just completely changed the world and made information available really real time anywhere in the world. And that's dri driven a lot of investment in the infrastructure for wireless, for data communications, for cloud computing, and is really a huge enabler for the economy of the world. And then you've got the Internet of Things, which is the next generation of devices that are going to be connected together that uh, really enable things to be automated and for us to understand what's going on in the world. And, and that's going to be the, the general topic here for the next 10 minutes. In general, the global semiconductor industry is about $300 billion uh, out of a total global GDP of about $60 uh, trillion. So we're about 0.5% of the global economy and, and what we do is even, you know, I think we're half a percent of that. So it's, uh, you kind of put your place in the world, but you look at the uh, kind of the outsize impact of the semiconductor industry and uh, software and a lot of the technology industries and how that really impacts the world. And it, and it really uh, is amazing how far we've come over the last uh, decade, uh, number of decades. So if you look, you know, we started back in the computing era with, you know, these big mainframe computers, mini computers, PCs. You know, the PC was the first 100 million unit market for electronic devices. And they, you know, started getting connected up to the Internet. Our first product was a modem that hooked computers up, you know, with that old dial-up modem. And that, that was, uh, those were good products back in the 90s. And, uh, and then, you know, that became, you know, a billion people connected to the Internet. And then the mobile phone came, and then smartphones came, and that became the first billion unit market per year. So today there are about two and a half billion mobile handsets sold. We're marching towards a billion smartphones, you know, the iPhones and Androids and all those. And those are all connected to the Internet. I mean, you've got an amazing amount of information. I, I left it over there so it doesn't buzz. But the, uh, you know, just an amazing amount of information. You know, you have applications running on that. And now you're able to connect and see the world and connect to a lot of other things. The Internet of Things is going to be all the other things in our world, all the other devices, all the other, you know, the light bulbs and the sensors and everything that's in our world is going to be connected together. And they're going to be, you're going to be able to turn them on, turn them off, see what's going on, and huge quantities of data. And it's predicted that by 2020 that'll be 10 billion units per year. So each year you'll sell more devices that are connected together than all the people in the world. Hopefully we don't have 10 billion people yet by, uh, by 2020. But so this is going to change our lives. I mean, you think of how, you know, cell phones and smartphones and that have changed the way we work, you know, for, for good and bad, this is, this is coming. And, uh, and I, I wanted to just kind of talk about some of the ways that it's going to change how we all live. And, and I, I could have put another, you know, this could have gone all the way across the room in terms of the number of different industries, the number of different applications that this is going to have. You've got uh, smart grid, things like, you know, energy monitoring, uh, smart metering. I mean, it, it impacts utilities and that, you know, if you can figure out how to turn off stuff, you don't have to build as many power plants. Um, you can see where leaks are and, you know, water and gas systems. There's, you know, there, it has impact into uh, industrial applications. You can think about the automation of security. I mean, everything from security cameras, you know, we've seen what the NSA is doing. But um, all of the, uh, you know, in, in the house, all the sensors and having them all connected together. You've got the connected home and the automation of, of buildings, um, of, of lights. You've got smart devices, all the fitness devices, uh, all the things that can connect to our cell phones with all the various technologies, all the impact that home monitoring can have on the cost of, of health care. And all this is going to be enabled uh, by uh, new types of devices. So this is going to create a lot of opportunity. It's certainly creating a lot of opportunity for our company in terms of new types of chips or new types of end devices or new applications that people hadn't even 
thought of before, and that creates opportunity for startups, it creates opportunity for software, for infrastructure providers, and certainly uh, in our world. And it's, it's, it's really an exciting area uh, to be in. The, um, let me go ahead through. So you've got really the convergence of a number of things. You've got chips, and you know, you, everyone knows about Intel, and you have Qualcomm and Broadcom. These are a lot of the big players in our world. And then you have a lot of software that has to get laid on top of those. And all of this is coming together with this data centers, the telecommunications that we talked about, cloud computing, big data, mobile devices, applications, and now this incoming internet of things, which is you know, from automobiles to buildings to every device that you can think of that were previously just separate now can be connected together. And this is going to take a long time. It's going to take a long time for uh, the uh, applications to be thought of for these types of systems to be deployed. This will be a trend for the next 20, 30 years um, until we really start seeing a lot of the benefits. But it's really enabled by these technologies that are, uh, that are in development. So it's really here today. And, um, you know, from my perspective, you know, the availability of these very low cost chips, which is what we'd like to do. Um, uh, with ARM, ARM is one of the big players in this. Uh, you know, all your phones have an ARM processor inside, and uh, that is kind of the new low-power computing uh, platform uh, competing with Intel. But for a lot of these end devices, it might be that each one of these little things that connects is connected with, you know, maybe it's got, you know, a tiny little battery, and it just sends out a little signal every minute or so, or it's energy harvesting and just off the solar cell or something like that, sensing the temperature in every room in your house. Um, and you can think about the same thing, uh, you know, in a building or in a city or, or all of these, just gathering bits of information and sending them back. Uh, you've got wireless connectivity. Everybody knows about Wi-Fi and uh, Bluetooth. Zigbee is the low power version that's coming along. Tons of different work on sensors and how to t turn things off and on. But really, this creates just a massive flow of, of information. And Big data and a lot of the software algorithms that go around that uh, will take these um, capabilities and really impact just lots of different aspects of, of business. And this is already happening today um, where we can see increased asset utilization, uh, certainly how to save energy and uh, reducing the environmental impact. But again, this gets back to you know, making things more efficient, um, improving productivity. You know, you can work anywhere. You can know that things are safe or you know that, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, you're, maybe you're more fit. Maybe you can, uh, uh, you know, spend more time working instead of, that's what I always try to figure out how to get people to do that. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, eliminating waste in the supply chain. The more data you have, the more you can optimize how things uh, uh, flow improving the customer experience, more personalized information. I mean, there's, uh, you know, lots of privacy and uh, other types of things there uh, as to, you know, how much information do we want people to have, but there's going to be a lot more of it. Of where do we go? What are we looking at? What are we doing that? And hopefully that can be used to, uh, to improve uh, how we do business. And then really reducing time to market across all the industries uh, as we can learn to be more efficient and, and, uh, and do that. So it's the, the impact of this, I mean, it's, it's hard to explain this in 15 minutes and, and what this trend means to our lives. You know, just as probably 10 years ago, it was hard to predict, you know, the iPhone and the smartphone and how that would impact things. But you can start seeing this coming together today. And with the technologies really exist, it's a matter of deploying them. And, uh, you know, I wanted to provide, you know, a, an element of hope as we look out into 2014 that, uh, that there's just a lot of exciting uh, opportunity sitting in front of us, uh, you know, as business leaders, as, uh, as consumers, as, you know, I'm somebody who loves to play with this stuff for sure. But if you look at the, the impact, you know, companies like Cisco, which is, you know, one of the largest telecommunications equipment providers, estimates that just the impact of these things uh, to industry, you know, really not talking about it. There's many other ways that this can impact, but, but it could be, you know, in the trillions. You know, they, they estimated $14.4 trillion over the next decade. So this is, uh, this is a big deal. 
So I'm going to give you back your two minutes. I think you're probably two minutes behind at least. And I'm happy to take questions after. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to talk about today is very, very local. So um, when I got asked to do this, my first question was, you know, why? Uh, but after that, I decided, well, you know, I could talk about like uh, pre-season of economic data or talk about global trends. But frankly, I don't know a whole lot about either of those. And so what I do know about, though, is kind of like what the startup community here in Austin looks like, how it's changed and where it's going, at least in my opinion. So that's what I was planning to share with you guys today. Uh, how's that sound? Great, because I'm going to do it even if you didn't like it. So <laughs> that was a, a false question. Um, so here are the things I'm going to talk about today. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of start, start talking about the startup demographics, kind of like what does a startup look like now in Austin? How does that change over time? And kind of where I see that going. And there's kind of good news and bad news uh, within that. Then we're going to talk about kind of the thing that drives a lot of startup innovation, which is, frankly, funding. Uh, a lot of startups, you know, the first thing they think about is like, well, here's my idea. And the second thing they think about is, like, do you think I could raise money? about that. I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs in town. I'm a mentor for a lot of entrepreneurs. You know, that be maybe good or bad for them. But they are constantly focused on like this idea of like, can I go raise money for that? Can I go raise money for that? And we're going to talk a little bit about what, what the local environment looks like for startups within that. Uh, then the third thing we're going to talk about is the talent pool. And so the thing that is probably the most important aspect of any business, whether it's a small business or a large business, and, and Tyson and I were talking about this uh, a little bit earlier, is can you hire? You know, the longer that I'm actually in charge of a business, even though we're, we're very small, we're very new, I, I really boil down my job into, into two things. Like, how do I get great people to agree to work there, and how do I keep them coming back every day? And if you can do those two things, chances are, as long as you're in the right market and you're solving the right pain, you're going to be okay. And so, as a software company, um, we don't have any assets, right? We have leased computers and IKEA furniture. Like, I think the total assets of our company is something like, like I had to do insurance, right? So I was like, well, how much assets do you have in your company? I was like, like nine dollars, like something. <laughs> um, and like, but you've ra like currently we've raised a million dollars. You only have nine dollars in assets. Like, isn't that amazing? <laughs> I'm sure, like my banker is like, hopefully not in the audience. Um, <laughs> But we're going to talk about talent pool, kind of like what the talent looks like here, how it's growing, how it's being consumed, and how, like as startups, we try to, you know, try to, try to, you know, get people to agree to start working for us. Um, my personal opinion as an entrepreneur is that most entrepreneurism is frankly irrational, right? If you're if you're looking at it just in terms of like maximizing your own wealth, it's a terrible idea. But if you're looking at it in terms of like trying to actually do something and do effect change in the world and to do something that, frankly, you can't do any other way, then it's fantastic. So we're kind of going to start off from there. So the first thing is, is that the startup community here in Austin is getting bigger. And I think that if you're walking around downtown, you're seeing you know, people talking about like big data or they're talking about like social media or how do I get you know, people to spend money somehow by looking at cat pictures. Like, this is all things that a lot of entrepreneurs are focused on right now. That last part is true and really sad, um, in, in my opinion. Frankly, I don't get the business model of cat pictures, but that, that's, that's, I'm sure that, that's me, right? Um, but we're really small comparatively, and I think this is a really important point that everybody in this room kind of needs to kind of take into their soul. Like, if you've been to Silicon Valley, like, you know how small Austin is. Like, we are tiny. Like, if you look at the, the entrepreneurial startup community of the world, it's literally 80% Silicon Valley, 20% the rest of the world. There are 1.2 million people who live in Travis County, OK? There are 350,000 Canadians who live in Silicon Valley. And the reason why those Canadians went to Silicon Valley, and by the way, that's 1% of the, all the Canadians in the world, they went there in order to start businesses. So Silicon Valley is the mecca of the entire world when it comes to startups. Austin, we kind of got the bleed over. So, and I don't want to sound pejorative about that, because that's good, because they had to go somewhere, right? And I'm glad they came here. But we need to understand this in context. 
we are very, very small. And we get people here because we have very specific demographics. And that is we have a relatively young population. Frankly, we have a very kind of fun city to live in. And we have this kind of reputation, earned or otherwise, is that you can be successful here, that it's a mini Silicon Valley. And that's, that's true in a lot of ways, but, it, but we aren't differentiated just upon that. And one of the things I think we need to do as a community is continue to differentiate, not just because like, oh, we're like Big Brother out there, but there's something unique about us. And I think that's a little lacking right now. Right now, people are just coming in here from you know, basic good feelings and you know, ACL and Formula One and all that stuff, which frankly annoys the crap out of me because I office downtown. <laughs> and there's like two weeks out of the year where I just can't get to my office and I'm just enraged by that. But anyway, the next thing is that there, there are a lot more startups in town than there used to be. And I think everybody would kind of agree to that. But, and there are more resources that are supporting those startups. So there's more incubators in town. So for example, Techstar started up this year. It's a great incubator, uh, has a great reputation kind of around the country and really around the world. There's UT programs like TVL, Texas Venture Laboratories, that is here is kind of the outgrowth of the Moocourt competition that, that I participated in. And there's lots of angel and VC activity. There's actually more and more venture capital activity in Austin. And it's not just firms regionally, which is historically what we've been good at, but also firms from the Valley, from the East Coast, from, sh from the Midwest or coming here to do deals. Because there's this idea and this feeling that there are deals to be done here and they can be done competitively. Um, deals typically here are priced lower than they are in the Valley. And frankly, that's one of the economic directives of you know, some of these firms is let's go, at, like, they don't like to compete for a lot of these deals with each other. And so it's like, okay, let's, let's kind of geographically be dispersed. Let's start to do deals in Austin. Let's start to do deals kind of in the Midwest, in Chicago, some of the non-traditional places. Um, there's also more talent here, both homegrown and transplants. I've met in the past six months probably a dozen uh, Carnegie Mellon machine learning experts. I don't know about you guys, but that's typically more Carnegie Mellon machine learning experts than I, than I would normally meet in like a six month period of time. Uh, there's a lot more talent coming here and they're mainly coming from the East Coast and from the Midwest. I don't know if it's the winners or what, but it's primarily from there. There is California talent coming into town, but for the most part, if you're talking about engineering and engineering in that area, it's not coming from there. It's actually coming from the Midwest and from, from the East Coast. And there's a cultural shift, I believe. Whereas entrepreneurism was always something like, it was, so the, the, how did it go? It was something like, you know, live music, UT, marijuana, entrepreneurism, like something like that, right? <laughs> Like, I, like, if you look back at the 90s and the, and the 80s, that was like the order of things in Austin. Now, I think entrepreneurism has certainly leapfrogged over marijuana. Um, and we're somewhere in there, like probably between UT and live music, right? I mean, somewhere, may, well, probably around there, right? And there's a reason for it, and it's a great reason. We're starting to be known for that culturally, and it's in our, in our ethos. That means that, you know, as part of the the, the way that we view the world and part of how we define ourselves is now much more about like being a startup. And now it's not just like a curiosity or like, why would you ever do that? It's kind of like, oh, that's cool. Um, the next trend is on the, the founder side. And the founders that I've experienced lately tend to be less experienced as part of this kind of like new talent coming in, young people coming in. Uh, they are less experienced and they seem to be more focused on solving market problems rather than hard business problems. And the, historically, Austin was kind of known in terms of you know, the IBM Innovation Center, kind of like the, the problems that we were solving as much more like semiconductor, logistics, hard business problems, right? Things that you needed, lots of letters after your name in order to even understand there was a problem there, and then they would go about solving it. And now we're kind of transitioning more into like these market-driven problems. And I think that for me personally, it's, it's bad news because there's lots of people trying to solve those problems and it's undifferentiating in terms of our focus as a geography. And so we had the best minds of my generation really focused on how to be the next MySpace, which by the way is not a good outcome, <laughs> versus the thousands of different business problems that are out there that people can really focus on, make real revenue from, and have a good outcome. Now, I may be totally biased right there because I don't get the social media uh, business model. I don't get it. You know, what, so what Datical does 
is we do um, database schema management for, for companies doing uh, agile development, and which is exactly as sexy as it sounds, right? Like, but we're a very small company, and the people that we sell to are people like Wells Fargo, well, Walmart, you know, um, into it. You know, we sell to large businesses, helping them solve a very specific problem that makes them more money. We can be marginally successful and have a great outcome. A lot of these folks now are focused on these, these business plans that require you to be outrageously successful, really to, to, to hit it. And I think that's just one of the trends. Uh, it's not one I personally agree with, but I, I think it's just happening. Uh, the local investment environment right now is much more active than it has been in the past. There are more firms, but they're doing smaller size deals. So the days of you know, raising $10 million A's, $20 million B's, those kinds of things, I think especially in the entrepreneur market are over. Like right now you're looking at you know, uh, $1.5 million A. You know, you're looking for a, you know, a $4 million B. So the capital requirements in general are much lower because it's much more efficient to start companies now, but also the amount of capital available for that is, is, is much lower as well. And that's been driven by, by a couple of things. If you look, I want to get into the economics of the venture capital community, but funds are getting smaller. There's too much money in there, and so they're looking to do smaller deals. Um, those firms are both active, in, as I said, locally, and also kind of greater geography. So you got more people coming in from the West Coast, from the East Coast, from the MS doing deals here. And they're also more angels. And those angels are more sophisticated, they're networked, organized, and funded. So Austin has had a lot of wealth creation lately. And those people are looking to deploy that wealth in a lot of different ways, but they're starting to get smart about it. Instead of just writing a check to some guy, you know, somehow it's like, oh, I think it's a great idea, you know, here's 50K, whatever. Now they're actually getting organized into networks where they have experts within that network, vet out deals, walk them through the process, and they're actually much more formalized. Um, this has been great also for a lot of businesses that could not attract venture capital funding. So venture capital is specifically for kind of something that can be really big in order to be successful. Angels really are kind of looking more for kind of residual income. There's a different investment profile there, which I think has been great. Um, and, I get, and again, these, these deal sizes are smaller. There's more activity. There's more shutdowns. So you see a lot of startups that are failing kind of right out of the bag. And that's a good thing, right? You're supposed to fail, and you're supposed to fail quickly and be able to go on to the next thing. But there are also higher expectations for raising money. So it's no longer, you know, here's the business plan. You know, all I need is $10 million, and we can make this stuff happen. It's like, show me a product. Show me market traction. Show me customers. And there is a greater feeling that you really have to prove yourself in the market in order to attract investment, even at small levels. And the last thing individually that I'm going to talk about, and after this I'm going to get into some of my, my forecasts for 2014, is the talent pool here in Austin. And I think this really drives a lot of the activity right now. Uh, Austin has great engineers. I don't think that anyone would disagree with that, either from the UT specifically or have transplanted themselves here. And that's why you have Apple thinking about being the largest employer in Austin. That's why Facebook has an office here. That's why Google hires engineers to work from here. And what does that mean if you're a startup? It means that I get to compete with Facebook and Google and IBM and Apple for the exact same people. And that's really hard because there's a lot of cachet in Austin. It's like, oh, where do you work? I work at Facebook. And it's like, oh, that's pretty cool. I mean, that, that is. Where do you work? Oh, I work at Google. Like engineering, like the first car that's ever gonna drive themselves and make you a sandwich or whatever, right? And that's that's like really cool. And like, well, what do you do? Like, I'm gonna start up, uh, and it's like, uh, what are you gonna do with that? So you gotta compete, and you gotta compete not only you know on the expectation, but also on the salary. So if you're doing a startup, realize that you're probably gonna pay people, and you're gonna probably gonna pay people a lot of money. And this becomes a little bit of cross purposes, right? Because you're raising money. You have to have higher expectations to raise money. You have to show more traction. But in order to pay people, you got to pay them market rates. So there's a, there's a disconnect between the availability of the funding and actually the people that you need in order to run that. And so the way you manage that is by you have more founders. So you see a lot of software startups that are actually have four, five, six people that are considered as founders from the beginning have larger equity stakes and they're more diverse within that. You don't see as many you know, one or two founder startups. Um, hardly at all anymore. And uh, there are more startups right now than there are good managers. So remember where we talked about like everybody's getting less experienced and younger? 
we have not reached that kind of critical mass where we have the right number of executives that can come in and help those startups. There's a discontinuity there. And also there's a discontinuity between what they're doing and the expertise we have locally. So the people that are, frankly, you know, my age and above that are supposed to be running and executing these companies don't have a lot of experience in the actual business plans and business models of the companies that are being started. So there's a big gap there. And frankly, that's one of the things that, that I think is going to lead to a lot of churn within startups lately. Um, there are certain specialities, and this is things that everybody's trying to do right now, that are incredibly hard to find. Uh, the first one is mobile. So there are so many different startups right now that say, oh, well, we got an app, you know, we're gonna do this, and we're gonna get an app, and we're gonna do this, and we're gonna get an app. It's like, great. Like, there are, there's nobody unemployed who can write an app. There is no mobile application developer who's right now looking on Monster, oh my God, how am I gonna pay my mortgage, right? <laughs> that guy does not exist. Guy, girl, if there was a chihuahua that could do that, that chihuahua would get employed. And finding those people is incredibly hard. Like you can talk to a recruiter and it's like, guys, you know, I'm willing to pay 20, and frankly, this is what it is, is 20 to 30% of that person's annual rate to a recruiter to find you that person. That person's making 140, 150 a year, so you're gonna pay 200K about to like find one guy who can write you a mobile app. Like how do you do that when you're raising money, like 100K, 50K at a time? It's really difficult. So that, I think, is also not informing a lot of people's business plans. When they have their go-to-market, it's like, oh, we're gonna write an app. It's like, well, how are you gonna do it? And it really all comes back to talent. How do you find people to go do that? Other things that are really hard are uh, user interface design. You know, if, if I had to do it over again, I would have majored in uh, data analytics and uh, human-computer interaction. And I would not have to do the startup thing in order to, to, to make money. Like, I could write my own check and go do that. You've got uh, people, especially like in the data analytics, data scientist field, that come out with a master's degree that are making two, three, four hundred thousand dollars a year doing this stuff. And that's driven specifically by big data and, and innovations. So you've got a difficulty here if what you're trying to do is in vogue, which is good for investment, but hard to find talent. And navigating those, those, those shoals are, are, I mean, it's one of the things a lot of startups struggle with. I couldn't find the right people. And when you do find a guy, like, you get so excited. You're like, oh my God, this is gonna be great. And you find him and he sucks. And you're like, oh, that's so terrible. Like, what do I do? And frankly, you start over, like your business ends. So these are my forecasts for 2014. Uh, first, this talent crunch is really gonna start to hurt growth. And it's gonna hurt growth primarily because being able to scale a business is the second most important thing for a startup. The first one, obviously, is starting, getting the market pain right, right? The second thing is being able to take that market pain, being able to scale it. And that, it takes more than just chutzpah. That takes more than just like, I've got a passion for the space. Frankly, like you gotta kinda know what you're doing in a lot of ways. And we have a lack of people who can inform startups on a lot, on a lot of that stuff. Um, again, there's gonna be more deals, but increasing small in size. Venture investment in Austin, I think, will remain the same or slightly decline in general. Uh, that is different than the trend nationally. Nationally, the venture investment is actually declining uh, by a fair amount, I think will be flat or a little bit low. But there'll be more what are called micro VCs and angel deals. So a micro VC is someone who puts in like 250K, maxes out in a million. So this is kind of what you're gonna see, I believe, that's gonna fund a lot of these startups. And then uh, my big thing is uh, that by the end of 2014, there'll be uh, this glut of, of failed startups. And this is a really good thing because they're supposed to fail. But the real question out of there is after those startups fail, what do they do? What do those founders do? And here's why that's really important for Austin and the economy in general, is the virtuous cycle of entrepreneurism starts with failure. And it starts with failure, learning, and trying again. And then failing, learning, and trying again. And you know, hopefully at some point in time you're successful, right? Because otherwise you're just masochistic. But eventually you gain enough experience that those entrepreneurs become the operators. Those entrepreneurs come to people that then become the executives, the CEOs, the management teams of other startups that end up, that end up rising up and with youth and vigor and all those things. And right now, there's, there's a gap in that life cycle. And I think it remains to be seen whether or not Austin will be able to keep attracting and, main, and retaining that entrepreneurial talent. Thank you.
You may be wondering uh, what qualifies an aerospace engineer to run a med device company. Uh, absolutely nothing. <laughs> um, all it allowed me to do was to, uh, to name my company Apollo, um, to have some tie <laughs> to, to, to my major. Um, but no, Pat, thanks for the, uh, the, the nice introduction and for digging up some of those facts. I, not many people reference Westlake High School in their, uh, their preamble, but uh, it's great to be here today and uh, glad that uh, Jay did all the economic uh, analysis because I, I really didn't, don't know the impact of foreign exchange rates on the med device industry in Austin, Texas. So um, and fortunately, I won't be asked to or won't be providing a lot of forecasts here. Um, I had the Longhorns going 12-0 and 0 and going to the National Championship game in my forecast. So we'll just focus on some, some uh, really nice life science trends that are happening uh, both globally and how those apply uh, in the state of Texas uh, in here in Austin. Um, first of all, I think we all get that healthcare innovation really does matter. Um, and if you look on the bottom right here, this is a life expectancy in the U.S. Uh, since uh, the 1900s, and you can see a pretty significant and continuous increase in the life expectancy of, of people here. Um, and, and, and I think we would all admit that most of that has been driven by innovation uh, in medical technology. Um, you know, in the early 1900s, a lot of it was just new surgical techniques um, and new sterile techniques. But really, from you know, really 1960 on, it was new medical technology that has, has led to the increase in life expectancy that, uh, that we see. So I think we all agree that it matters. Um, you know, medical innovation can also be costly. And so, you know, if you look at trends of healthcare spending as GDP, um, you know, you look at the United States um, and really around the world, we spend a lot of money on healthcare. Um, that's a good thing. Um, but as we see from, you know, the government being shut down this week, you know, arguably over healthcare, um, you know, it, it's also an expensive thing. And so, you know, as we look at medical innovation and we talk about that, it's this constant pro and con of, investing our cash and, and our economic gains in innovation while at the same time trying to find ways to reduce those costs. Um, and, and so that's just a constant global challenge that we're managing. But I think you know, one of the things that's really important to know as well, so you know, as much as we complain about the U.S. percent of GDP on healthcare, all of these emerging markets um, are increasing their expenditures as well. So you know, while we're all trying to become more efficient in the delivery of healthcare, um, we're all realizing that medical technology is allowing our, our nations and our people to, to live healthier lives. And so you know, that's why I'm in this business and uh, why a lot of my colleagues are committing our lives to, uh, to bring these new technologies to market. Um, you know, another big trend that you're seeing is just the, the, the access that people around the world have to new medical technology. Uh, this is uh, Nagasar Reddy. Um, you guys probably don't know him. Uh, he's a world-leading gastroenterologist based in Hyderabad, India. And um, you know, he speaks at a lot of our conferences, is, is a real innovator in technology. Um, but one of the, the biggest innovations that he's done is a, a mobile endoscopy unit. And he drives to the hinterlands of India, places that during a monsoon you can't even you know, get uh, a non-four-wheel drive car there, and brings first world medical technology, technologies that we develop, to those villages to, to help those individuals provide access. If you, so when you think about and hear about China and India and these emerging markets and Brazil, you know, a lot of that is due to innovations like this, where we're providing you know, not just the new uh, ability to sell a new device into that country, it's, it's giving the patients access. And, and the access that these people have um, around the world today is, is truly remarkable. Um, so you know, what's happening in Texas then? Um, we estimate, and uh, this data is, as my marketing group says, is leverage from uh, THBI. Uh, leverage is just a fancy word in marketing for plagiarizing data. Um, but about $75 billion is expected, uh, is the expected impact uh, uh, over the past several years uh, in healthcare. Um, we have about 89,000, 90,000 probably people now who are working in the healthcare industry. So we're a pretty big job creator here um, in the state. Um, and ironically, we're, we're number two in clinical trials. And you ask, well, what does clinical trials have to do with innovation? Um, that means that when, when new companies are developing new innovation, new technology, they're, they're testing and evaluating that here in the state. Um, and that's a really good sign about the type of innovation the infrastructure that we have. Uh, the Texas Medical Center in Houston is world class. Um, I was just there yesterday. Um, and the amount of infrastructure that we have in the state is, is truly stunning. And what's really exciting now is you're starting to see a coalescence of that uh, to really enable early stage innovation to happen here um, uh, in our local community. So you know, really, what are, the, what are the key areas that are leading to the growth um, uh, trends in life sciences in Texas? 
Um, you know, it's really three things. It's the, you know, public investment, um, which is a big piece of uh, where healthcare uh, funding comes from. Uh, venture capital, um, as evil as we all like to complain about venture capitalists, uh, they, they invest a lot of money in innovation um, and have been a big investor in what we're doing at Apollo. Um, and then industry itself, you know, once these companies become successful, they're reinvesting back in the community uh, and providing a, a really strong economic impact. Um, you know, this is a, a list here just, you know, of the public research, uh, the top 10 medical institutions in Texas for a biomed R&D is $2.4 billion, um, and then another you know, couple hundred million dollars you know, spread in some of the, the smaller institutions. That's a lot of money um, that's going into basic science research uh, here in the state. And you know, it's an exciting trend that we see, um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, there's a, a great quote that, that uh, you know, no one's ever been cured by a nature paper. So you know, it's great that we're doing basic science research, but at the end of the day, you know, it's getting those technologies out of the research lab and into the community that really impacts all of us as consumers of healthcare. Um, another great thing we're doing in Texas, we're educating a lot of life science people. Um, you know, I think, uh, over the past three years, we've graduated over 50,000 uh, people focused on the life sciences. Uh, the biomedical research uh, engineering group here at Texas was non-existent when I was in school here, uh, and now is the number one uh, enrolled engineering program at UT. So students now are dedicating their careers to learning about the biomedical spaces um, and either going to med school, going to the PhD to do further research, um, or, or moving along um, and going into industry. So again, very exciting trends. Uh, this is probably what I'm most excited about um, as, a, as a local resident here, and, and this is the new medical school. Um, and I think you know, all of us are aware of uh, the amount of work and, and effort that went into to approve uh, the new medical school, uh, which I guess now is officially the Dell Medical School. Um, but this was a really unique partnership between the university, uh, the community, uh, Seton, um, and the local philanthropic community to actually get ourselves um, the, the first medical school here. And, you say, well, what does that mean for me for a patient? Well, what it means now is if you have or know somebody who has you know, a more complicated or aggressive cancer, you won't have to drive to Houston to go to MD Anderson. That advanced type of care will be happening here in Austin as opposed to um, being happening in, in Austin and, I mean, Houston and Dallas and, and other parts of the world. Um, but from a, a personal perspective and a selfish perspective, what this means for a company like Apollo is we don't have to go you know, do our early research and our early collaboration um, you know, at the Mayo Clinic or at Hopkins or you know, again drive to Dallas or Houston to work that. We can do that here locally. So again, um, I guess we're not quite sure where this is gonna be yet, if we're gonna you know, build a new basketball stadium um, somewhere for UT and, and, and put the med school there or what. But um, you know, again, this is something you guys should be really, really excited about because I think in 15 to 20 years, we'll look back and say, it was one of the more transformative things we've done for our community. So what, what's happening from an industry perspective and in investment? Um, this is just a list of some of the larger companies um, that are headquartered uh, here in Austin, Texas. And um, you, know, you may not know all of them. You know, if you're in my space, these are some of the titans uh, of industry. Uh, we're really strong in orthopedics um, in Austin. Um, you know, we have uh, some of the, the most advanced orthopedic research happening right here. Um, don't really know why <laughs> orthopedics uh, in Austin. Uh, St. Jude, which is a, a, a big cardiovascular company, they do pacing and, and a variety of different things, is, is based here in Austin. Uh, Assurigen was founded uh, by a guy named Matt Winkler, who was a zoology professor here at UT, um, has started three very successful life science companies in Texas. And, um, and again, you're just starting to see more and more life science infrastructure moving to Austin and bringing that talent, as Dan was saying, you know, the talent is so important. You know, now, if you're an early stage um, uh, life science researcher or you, you want to develop your career in marketing even, you can now come join a startup company in Austin, Texas, and know that if it doesn't work out, that you know, hopefully you can grab a job with one of these guys. Um, so again, really exciting innovation. Um, I put these up there, um, you know, both about some of the opportunities of public investment and in innovation and also some of the travails. Um, CIPRIT, um, which actually Apollo was one of the first recipients of uh, CIPRIT funding and, and really enabled us to be uh, successful and, and to raise our future financing, um, has obviously <laughs> had some uh, ups and downs from a uh, controversy standpoint. But at its core, these programs, whether it's the Emerging Technology Fund, 
um, the enterprise fund are separate. These are crucial for the early stage life science companies. You know, Dan was talking about the trend of um, uh, in, uh, investment in information technology companies where that investment level is down, where a million and a half dollars is your Series A. It's the exact opposite in life sciences. The average cost of drug development is about half a billion dollars to get a, you know, if a guy, a professor here has an idea for a drug, for that to get onto a pill in a pharmacy is about half a billion dollars. Um, Apollo will spend um, probably a hundred million dollars of investor money before we're profitable. It's really, really expensive to do that. And because of that, if you're an early stage angel investor in life sciences, um, that's, a, that's a big rock to push up the hill. And so these funds are critical for making that early investment, allowing those founders to, to you know, prove out these technologies and reduce risks so that the you know, venture capitalists or other investors can come in and, and move those technologies along. So again, this has been a really important trend. And, and, and actually, if you look at this relative to other states, uh, no other state, you know, even California and New York, uh, cannot compare to the resources we have in Texas for early stage investment in uh, new technologies. So that's a really exciting trend. Um, you know, I'm really excited about the venture investment that's happening in Texas. Um, so these are companies who've kind of, you know, moved out of the incubator of the of the universities and and are actually been able to raise significant amounts of uh, venture financing. Um, IDEV is a company that came out of uh, MD Anderson. Uh, they had a new type of peripheral stent um, that uh, is allowed allows you to put it in the leg so it doesn't kink when it bends, which is really a huge issue if you have a lower vascular disease of your leg. Um, Onyx Life Technologies, which is uh, just uh, up the road here in Austin, uh, they have a, a, a new type of coated heart valve. So, you know, if you have a, a, a valve replacement surgery, uh, most oftentimes now you're going to get an Onyx valve. Uh, TVA is an early stage startup. Uh, they just raised their Series A financing. Uh, they have new flexible catheters for um, uh, renal denervation, uh, which is a very exciting space. Uh, Myrna Therapeutics, uh, this is actually a Matt Winkler uh, uh, company as well. Uh, they just raised the largest life science biotech round uh, in Texas uh, this year with some of the top venture capitalists around the world. So a lot of money is being pumped into the local economy, which is a really, really good sign. Um, and again, you know, as, as Dan said, not all of these startups are going to be successful. Um, these will, hopefully, and hopefully Apollo will. But um, it's, it's that investment in innovation that allows you to start reaching a critical mass. And, and you're really starting to see that, see that locally. Um, so at Apollo, you know, we're doing kind of our own different type of economic uh, uh, development, and that's really importing innovation. So, um, you know, we were founded with uh, a collaboration between five or six institutions uh, where we actually took intellectual property um, from Mayo Clinic and Johns Hopkins and uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong. I, I didn't know that that was their logo either on the bottom right. Um, but uh, we licensed about 50 patents um, into Apollo and brought those uh, patents and technologies here to Austin, Texas. And that was the foundation of our company and, and led us to, to develop some of the surgical instrumentation that uh, uh, Pat was mentioning earlier. So again, there, there are lots of different trends like this that once you start building that infrastructure, you start to see these things coalesce in the community. And, and Austin really is uh, emerging as a leader in the space. Um, so, you know, what we're doing um, is taking endoscopy, which has typically been a diagnostic space. So if you've gone to the gastroenterologist for your colonoscopy, they could diagnose a problem for you, but they couldn't treat it. And to treat it, you'd have to go to a surgeon to have laparoscopic surgery done. They open you up, put ports in. Um, I would normally show a video here, but <laughs> Pat, <laughs> Pat, Pat said that's probably not a good idea, um, given some of our vid videos can be quite graphic. Um, but, you know, this, is, this has led to uh, a new field of surgical innovation called uh, endoscopic surgery, which really means you can you do surgery from the inside out. So um, using the, the flexible endoscopes, um, as you're diagnosing problems, you can actually start treating them. And it's a pretty exciting innovation. I will show pictures. Uh, this is a stomach. And, and again, you know, the thought here is with these flexible tools, you can sew, you can cut, and you can do all the normal things that you would do from a laparoscopic procedure, um, but go home an hour later. So, you know, again, this is the type of innovation that uh, is happening right here um, in your community. So from a global perspective, then how does that tie? Um, this is a group of uh, students in uh, France. Uh, the uh, ERCAD France um, is the uh, most notable surgical training institute in the world. Uh, they do an entrepreneurship uh, series, and I, I was teaching there and teaching some of these students who are, you know, you know, coming up with new surgical ideas and innovation and trying to commercialize them. Um, you know, these are technologies that we would develop here at Apollo Endosurgery. Um, and, in fact, the students uh, broke into teams. 
Uh, they developed new prototypes, new technologies uh, in core areas that we were all interested in. Um, we picked up some of those technologies, and why do we pick them up? So the guys in India can put them on their mobile van. So you know, we really are becoming uh, a global economy of healthcare, and uh, the innovation that's happening here in Texas is uh, going around the world. So again, thank you very much. First question, if electronics is getting cheaper, why does all data have to be hauled up to the cloud? Um, and a, a related question, lo why is local computer, computing or storage not popular um, because? So for example, at home um, or in the consumer space. Yeah, so the, uh, the cloud is where all the data can come together and there's actually a, uh, a trend towards the, all these endpoints have to have a certain amount of processing and you end up with limited bandwidth links back to the back to the cloud. So you have to be able to take in sensor data and to be able to select out what's important. Like you might say, okay, well, if the temperature gets above this, then tell me, otherwise, you know, be quiet. And that has to do with, uh, you also don't want to take very much energy to do that. So, uh, so there is a trend towards these ARM processors getting out into all of these low cost end nodes um, and, and coming away from the cloud, but the, the, all the data comes into the cloud then has to be communicated and that's where we all access it and, and where a lot of the, the aggregation is happening. So it's kind of a combination of s these smart end nodes that can communicate, sense, actuate, and uh, also do a fair amount of processing. And that all has to get into you know, a very small chip and is driven by Moore's law that every generation you get lower power and more computing power. And uh, so that's, that's all uh, part of this trend. Uh, of the Internet of Things. Thank you. Everybody live? All right, so um, I'm going to combine a couple. So um, for Daniel, could you talk about differences between micro VCs or something like uh, Techstars Accelerator Program, pros and cons of those approaches for um, a more experienced professional? And then the related question that came up is talk a little bit about uh, crowdfunding and how that might impact the local community. Yeah, so like all the, the Kickstarter projects and things like that. I think, I think actually that's, that's fascinating. Um, I think Kickstarter projects are really good for products or services that have a, a relatively broad appeal. I think the more niche you become within what you're trying to offer, that, that becomes harder and harder. Um, the differences between like the incubators and the micro VCs, there's a lot of overlap there. So for example, Techstars has its own fund that goes along with the incubator, and they make an investment directly in each of the companies that they allow into their program and try to help them and, uh, and facilitate the raising of more money as they exit the program. Um, micro VC is, is really just a, a, a concept of scale. So the micro VC eventually started to come around uh, when there was a real gap in the, in the angel funding. And now kind of angel funding and micro VC have kind of split off really just in terms of you know, what is the, the expected uh, outcome? So a, angels like to invest in things that, for example, just start throwing off cash, and they can get some kind of annuity effect from that. Micro VCs are very interested in focusing on businesses that uh, have a very short runway to revenue, but then have the opportunity for growth you know, within that. So that's kind of more of a market segmentation in terms of what their investment profile is than really a, a, a dollar difference. Daniel, can you expand on uh, the impact of crowdfunding, aka the Jobs Act, and what all that means to your business? Uh, to my business specifically, it, it doesn't doesn't matter a whole lot. Um, the The impact of, of crowdfunding, in general, I think it, it, you know, it's almost become a a selling point to attract additional funding because it's almost like a become a marker of market demand. So like if I'm able to attract 10,000 people, five people, 20 people, you know, whatever it is, who've been able to put up X number of dollars just for a free product or a t-shirt or you know, a button or whatever you, know, you end up giving away. It's a great indication of kind of like the primary market research. Are you solving something that people are really interested in? There have been uh, some cases where you can get almost your entire funding from that mechanism itself, which I think so I've got two minds of it. One, if it's really just like I gotta send them a button, then that's great. 
Like if I got to carry them on my cap table, like I could imagine having 10,000 people on my cap table. Like that would just be, like, could you imagine like getting releases? Like it would just be, you know, completely unworkable. Uh, personally, I think it's fantastic and it's, it very much kind of starts to lower the veil of, of raising money for a lot of entrepreneurs. Like I can just throw someone out there and see what happens. So in that way, I, I think it's great. Um, I do think, though, that, there, that we've got to be careful because I think there's a lot of people who are going to get burned from, from, from putting money into those and expecting like outrageous returns out of it. There's a reason why you've got to be a qualified investor in order to sign up for a lot of these is because, frankly, you've got to be willing to, to, to lose all your money and be okay. All right. I've got uh, a couple of questions around the idea of, for all of you about finding talent. Where do you find talent? Um, and the one you can, anybody can jump in, but the one thing um, specifically that was, was mentioned um, was how to vet um, talent. Um, software engineers was, was uh, mentioned for Daniel, but could you all talk a little bit about um, your methods in trying to find, find talent? Yeah, sure, maybe I can, uh, I can start. So we, uh, we've uh, really focused in on a lot of uh, the new college grad hiring. We, we just hired 56 new college grads who started in June. Uh, I would also say that Austin is a very attractive place for a 23-year-old engineering grad to, uh, to move to. And so the, uh, I, I've spent my whole career talking people out of California, and it's gotten a little bit easier over the last uh, five to ten years. Uh, but it, it is, the, I mean, it is the, the foundation of, of the company, and like, you know, if you, whatever you want to achieve, it's being able to find, uh, to attract that talent and uh, Austin is a, Austin is a great place to be. I mean, we really have now. Uh, I would say that the access to talent is not our primary, you know, uh, limit on on the growth of the company. We were able to find uh, a lot of experienced people who want to move here, and also top graduates from uh, from a lot of the, the universities. Right, and I would say that you know, people coming out of the Northeast and the uh, the Midwest is is also a trend. They're even more. Uh, flexible than the uh, California, so. Better weather, right? <laughs> we, we also interview people in the fall and the spring. Yeah. So, <laughs> exactly. so it's a little surprise element. There. So uh, I, the, the great thing about, let me, let me put it this way, uh, hiring, you got to, the only thing worse than not being able to find anybody to hire is hiring a bad person, right? Because that actually, degrade you rather than accelerate you. I've got a very firm belief that people congregate in terms of uh, ability level, and great engineers hang out with other great engineers. So if you know one person who's a great engineer, even if you can't hire them or find them or convince them to go, they've got like four buddies. And just say like, hey, can I just like run this idea past you? And I just want your feedback. Like don't give them like, I want to recruit you or whatever. Just like, Hey, let me let me give you the give me the opportunity to, to run this past you, and you tell me if this is a good idea or not, and then you start to get them engaged, you start to get them, and then what what it becomes is like, well, would you be interested in doing something like this? And the answer is either sure or no, and if it's no, you do the same thing that you do whenever you get a no, a definitive no from anybody, a customer, a VC, or whatever. You say, okay, but do you know anyone who would say yes? And you use that to network to other people. Uh, finding those first few hires is a very personal endeavor. So it's, it's something you can't really shortcut and something you've got to kind of work through the network to get. Yeah, and for us it's very similar. You know, there's not a, a large employment pool of life science employees here in Austin, so we, we relocate most of our talent. Um, and, you know, similarly, I think, you know, two key pieces of that, one is the peer networks. So, you know, you identify, a, you know, a really good person, you know, in one of the larger companies, um, they have their network. Um, you, you attract that type of person, and then, you know, to Dan's point, you're able to attract the talent that's around those people, and, and that's a pretty effective way to grow. Uh, and then the other piece is vision. Um, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, I think for your company, um, particularly in an early stage company, you have to set the vision for something that's really exciting that these people want to be a part of. You know, a lot of times we recruit people out of Johnson & Johnson and Covidian, and they're just burned out by the big corporate thing and lack of innovation and lack of t new technology. And, yeah, when we sell them a vision of what we're trying to do at Apollo, you know, they're willing to, to look at picking up and moving, and then we tell them it's Austin, Texas, and we have ACL coming up. It makes it a heck of a lot easier. Except for the parking. Yeah. Isn't it ridiculous? And the traffic. Oh, my God. 
we, we had them come in the fall and spring too, and we had their interviews in the middle of the day so they don't see the traffic that we have. So. Anybody live? It's all Jay, fun. we've got time for a couple more questions. Okay, great. Um, so let me also put a couple together. We've, we've had a couple of questions about the Affordable Care Act. Um, and so one theme is, can you talk about any impact you see either on your organizations or on the region? Um, and the second is, um, were you surprised by um, glitches and access in the database and what are the implications about um, the data and, 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 and that act going forward? Yeah, I mean, in terms of the, uh, the impact uh, for us, we self-insure. So we have a fairly young population. We do use, uh, you know, insurance providers to administer the system. So we do have some additional cost that has come on because of having to cover students and, uh, you know, people up to the age of 26. Uh, but overall, uh, you know, our hope, actually, if we look into 2014, our health care costs are uh, going up slower than they have in past years. And our hope is that being able to cover everyone and, and some degree of being able to, to maintain uh, costs over time uh, to lower that is going to be really, really critical. We spend about $12,000 per employee on health care right now, which is, which is a big number. I mean, it, for, some, for a company that's you know, highly paid engineers and high talent, this is maybe not as big of an impact, but if you're running a business that has uh, you know, low cost, low wage, I mean, there's, there's a lot of impacts to the, uh, to the cost of healthcare, and it's a, it's a huge problem in Texas that uh, hopefully uh, we can make some progress on. Yeah, it's kind of a nightmare. Um, for, for us, because we're a small business, one of, the, one of the things about uh, the Affordable Care Act is that you're no longer allowed to discriminate against people based upon their age or their gender, which, you know, I guess philosophically I'm cool with, but when you have employees that are primarily young males, and those are the ones that had lower premiums, it means that when you're no longer discriminated for, I guess, you, you pay higher, higher costs. And so it is, I mean, it, it's something that I actually think about a lot. And I know a lot of small businesses, what we're doing is, and what we're doing, is we are renewing our policy uh, December 1st. And so that allows us to actually maintain our rates throughout the full year and then have to deal with the additional costs the next year. But yeah, and it's, it, it's a big deal, absolutely. We, you know, for our healthcare costs, we've got 20 employees, you know, we spend, you know, 15 grand a month on healthcare for them. And that's, that's a lot of cash for us. I mean, that's, that's an additional hire that we could have. We could grow 5% more if we could, could avoid that. But, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. One of the things we offer to all of our employees, though, is that we cover not only them, but we cover their uh, significant others and all of their dependents. And we take the entirety of that premium on the company. And that's one of the ways we actually differentiate from, you know, a lot of the big employers in town. Yeah, at Apollo, I think we're more focused on what it's going to do f to the market for our products. Um, you know, as a provider of medical technology, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, I think, in, in the pharmaceutical, and particularly in the medical device industry, as to the impact that this is going to have. You know, on one hand, it's great, you know, you, they just expanded the size of our market because more people have access to go have procedures done. Um, on the other hand, there's going to be significant pricing pressures um, on the products, and, you know, we have a new medical device tax that um, is 2%, you know, put straight onto any revenue that we sell, regardless of how much money we're losing as a company right now. So it, it, it's, it's mixed, and I think most of the companies are really taking a wait and see. Um, I think we all realize that uh, health care costs are a significant problem, and what we've been doing is not sustainable um, as an economy. And, and so I think you know, we're all looking for that solution. Um, I don't think anybody's convinced that this is the total solution, though, and so you know, we're, we're cautiously watching and seeing the impact that this is going to have on our markets. All right, thanks. Are they live? One more question, Pat? That's it. One more. Okay. So... Um, a question, you know, we, we talk a lot about the benefits of Austin, how it's doing well, and urban economists talk about things like agglomeration. Things come together and it helps everybody, right? Um, there's spillover benefits. And we don't, what industries that are not up on the stage today would you think about as being benefited, benefiting from Austin's economy, the tech expansion, technologies, people wanting to move here? Where are the spillovers? Um, so where, where um, they're not represented up here, are we going to see benefits to, in Austin um, for next opportunities? Let's start at the other end. 
<laughs> I'll, I'll, throw out, I'll, throw out, I'll throw out one. Uh, yeah, throw can out. we have a softball play? Uh, yeah. yeah. I'll, um, I'll throw out one, which, which is, uh, you know, home developers. Yeah. Right? So, so it's a good time to be in real estate, good time to be in real estate in Austin. Um, I was going to comment on the fact that we pay a lot of money to lawyers. <laughs> so <laughs> every time I do a financing, you know, uh, I, I think it'd be great to be a securities ex uh, attorney here uh, here in town. I, I don't know. From a startup perspective, um, you know, our impact, it, you know, from a indirect it, is a little bit different because we don't have the large employee base that we bring here. But um, what we do see, though, is we do see, you know, as for example, the life science industry has is starting to grow grow here. Uh, you're starting to see some of the more the support industries come here. So we're having uh, CROs, clinical research organizations, relocate to Austin to be around these companies. Um, you know, we have um, you know, actually one of the largest international regulatory advisory firms is run by a Dutch guy right downtown. Um, and they're here because of the growing thing. So, you know, again, I, I think you know, for, for it, it's a little smaller impact that we see with what we're doing. I mean, you know, I, I don't know how many houses we've built for people at Apollo. Um, we're trying to do our part. But, um, you know, I think once companies get larger, of course, and you look at, you know, the Google effect where, you know, companies go public and next thing you know, you've got, you know, 400 millionaires running around um, the place. Um, you know, ultimately, that's, I think, the impact that you'll see from uh, the investment in, in the early stage companies that, uh, you know, Dan and I are running. You know, for me, it's, I'm, it's, it's more things like restaurants, it's um, real estate, it's the, the, the overall cultural you know, vibrancy of, of, the, of the community. Um, you know, so I've been here since, I, I, I'm gonna date myself, but like I came here for my undergrad in 1992. And there was this, there was this old Austin hippie, you know, there was that guy who had long braided hair, smoked a lot of weed, probably worked for the cable company, you know, that kind of thing. And that guy's gone. And now it's much younger people, it's much hipper people, it's much more kind of like, you know, uh, cosmopolitan, I guess you'd say. And I think you're gonna see Austin transition from a sleepy quaint town, which it used to be, and to what it's already becoming, which is a cosmopolitan, almost undifferentiated city from a San Francisco, a Boston, a Chicago, uh, I won't say New York, because New York is, is its own kind of differentiation. And so the, the industries that are going to um, really benefit from that, I think, are going to be some of the lifestyle industries that are gonna come around. So it's the restaurants, it's the bars, transportation's gonna be a big thing. So moving people around, like we were talking about parking, like parking sucks in this town. Like I don't know if anybody else thinks that, but it's terrible. And that's gonna lead to its own kind of innovations and its own kind of like urban planning and, and uh, kind of out of the box thinking. Well, I wish I could say that the Internet of Things is gonna solve all these problems, <laughs> but uh, you know, we, we, we had half the company out building a, a, a Habitat for Humanity house earlier in the week. And I think that the quality of life issues and uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, affordability issues that we've got just keep getting, getting more and more difficult. And I think we've gotta, gotta keep uh, keep focusing on that, and uh, and also keep Austin weird. Yeah. It's, uh, it's definitely uh, and I and I for one am just extremely excited about the British Air flight to London that's starting up in 2014. So uh, that'll be that's that's uh, you guys have to thank us for you know all those trips to London that uh, that somehow <laughs> made that possible. And I think that's an indication of us uh, you know getting up out of the point where we're uh, we're on the radar. So it's great. And we do thank you. For those of you who registered for this event, there will be a link of all of the video that was shot. It will be sent to you via email in about two weeks. And just a reminder, these economic forecast events are continuing. On October 17th, we will be in Houston covering the topics of healthcare, energy, and big data. Then on October 25th, we go up to Dallas and we talk about retail manufacturing and commercial development. For our sponsors, Texas Mutual, Pierpont Communications, BB&T, Corporate Finance Associates, and the AT&T Conference Center, we thank you. To Jay, Tyson, Daniel, and Dennis, our thanks to you all. Have a good week.